Hello and welcome to New Life. Thank you for joining us today. We're glad you're taking time to listen. We hope that this resource helps you know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make an impact. Enjoy the message. All right, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 4, listen to the words, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, and it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You realize that simply by reading verses 4 and 5, I have now given you a lifetime of counseling sessions. I want you to think through it. What would your marriage be like if I said, if your children, when asked about your marriage, said, when my parents are dealing with each other, they're patient, they're kind, they don't envy one another, they don't boast to one another, they're not proud, they don't dishonor each other. You never find one looking after themselves and not the other. It's not easy to make them angry. They do not keep a record of wrongs. They do not delight in evil, but they rejoice with the truth. They always protect each other. They always trust each other. They always have hope in one another. And they seem to always persevere. What if your kids described your, wait, why don't your kids describe your marriage that way? Why don't they? Pause, pause. I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty. Would they? And if not, why? And if not, what can you do to help make that better? One thing at a time. You say, there's a lot of stuff in that list. I know. One thing at a time, pick the one that you think will make the biggest difference. Y'all all all right? You say, this sounds like work. Yeah, all relationships are work. They require a commitment to excellence and a commitment to whatever effort is going to take to go forward. Every relationship is like that. But if verses 4 And five, six, and seven, if those describe your relationship, then verse eight will be yours to claim. Love never fails. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I believe that, and you always tell us that the Bible is always true, but I'm pretty sure I've been in love and it failed me. I want everybody to hear me, okay? Love never fails us, but we often fail love. You say, no, 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 somebody else's fault. It's always shared. We can't fail love. Love requires commitment. Today we want to talk about that commitment, what commitment looks like. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be very honest with you from the start because I know what the pastors are going to say in the video, and I, I, I kind of know what Tina and I are going to say, although there's always a wild card. And so, uh, so, so, so I, I know what's about to happen, and I'm, going to t- I'm, I'm just going to confess to you ahead of time, you're not going to hear a lot of things that are terribly romantic tonight. What you are going to hear is a lot of things that are significantly helpful They're going to help you. They're going to help you live out a commitment. Because in the end, love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotion. Love is a choice of the will held in place by a commitment to come hell or high water, never give up. That's what love is. You say, that doesn't sound romantic at all. That sounds difficult. Well, that's my first point. 
commitment is difficult. It's not easy. You say, but once we get married, we're supposed to like skip through tulips the rest of our life. Yeah, I don't know what movie you've been watching, but it's lying to you. Every relationship is tough. Look, can I be honest with you? If you have children, you are going to create humans that it is difficult for you to get along with sometimes. You made them. And it's still tough to get along with them sometimes. Every relationship requires work. Every relationship requires commitment. And every commitment is difficult. Take a look at this. The thing I think of most is uh, the journey we're taking now with Encounter. Um, we're, you're definitely working a lot, and we're both, I mean, I'm working a lot with the children, and we're having to stay committed and put in a lot of time, mm -hmm. but we're seeing the community and the people coming to church, and um, that's pretty exciting. My, in our case, we're a young church plant. It'll be a year in October for us. And while we enjoy the journey, it's fun. Uh, we know God's called us, but it can be very demanding and challenging, frustrating. Uh, and you're asking God, like, are you for real about this? And he always comes through. And to let you reconfirm your calling and reconfirm that I put you out here. Because if it was easy, easy, everybody would do it. And uh, planning a church uh, is not easy. Most people don't remember, but before Pastor Mike got here, we were 79 people, 70 people. And it took like 20 years just to get that or 30. And now it's the church of thousands of people, but people don't remember the days when Pastor Mike first got here. It was hard. And then Tiff's a great shoulder to cry on and lean on. And then when uh, she may have a hard day, hardly ever, but when she does, I've got some pretty big shoulders to cry on too. Well, a month before we were supposed to get married, Aaron was in a very bad car accident and he ended up in the hospital and he lost a lot of blood and he had a cut around his head about like so. And I suppose some people would have said, we're not in any shape to go ahead with the wedding. I don't think either one of us ever considered that. He wasn't in good shape, but he was living <laughs> <laughs> and he was ready to face the future and I was ready to face it with him. And when we got married, he couldn't, he couldn't turn his head right. And he had that terrible scar that showed up in the wedding pictures, but we were a happy pair. Commitment, I don't know that I've ever fought with that because I came from a family that was committed. Uh, I, I just always knew that uh, Kathy was a person I could commit myself to and I wanted to live with for the rest of my life. And uh, hey, it just came to me, I don't know, just accepted the fact that this is the only woman I'm going to be married to. I better make it good. And that's what I know. It can make, commitment is just making up your mind you're going to do something and doing it. You got it. <laughs> and I've never been sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when we were, we had two kids. We had our girls, um, yeah. and we were both in school. Toya was finishing uh, her master's. I was finishing my, my bachelor's. Uh, we both were working full time, um, and we had just found out that we were pregnant with our third child. Yes. And <laughs> when I look back on that, when I think about that time period, um, I just, I don't understand how we even made it mm -hmm. because we saw each other so little. It was, it was always ships passing in the night, you know, um, I worked nights and went to school in the day. Um, and, and Toya was, was working and taking care of the kids. And it, it was just a lot on our plates, mm -hmm. but I think the thing that really got us through that was just knowing that difficult times like that have a beginning and an end date to them. And we knew that even though we were exhausted and, and not really as connected as we wanted to be, 
Uh, we knew that that time was eventually going to come to an end. Yeah. We were working towards something. It was a, a shared goal that we had. And uh, that was kind of what helped us to get through that. Yeah. Joy coming in the morning. <laughs> and I woke up every so morning. Churchy. <laughs> when is joy coming? Is it this morning? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. I think, I mean, before we moved here, that's also a thing that we prayed about. And we weren't going to make a decision until we had an answer. And we got an answer, and our first season is definitely going to be here. And I think even if it's been really tough, um, I mean, both for you and me, because it's been tough for me, so. It makes it tough for it makes me. it tough for you. Uh, it's been worthwhile, definitely. Because you get to look at me. <laughs> I will say for us, uh, I, I, I guess I should speak for myself, I find commitment more difficult. I make it more difficult. Because I find that a lot of times I tend to focus on what I want. I find myself to be a very selfish person at times. Um, we probably all do. I, I, I don't. I, I disagree, but I'll let her keep talking. <laughs> he doesn't know what goes on in here. <laughs> and the fight that we have in our heads, um, in our minds. And so... Um, I had uh, a pastor say once that, um, you know, we should focus on the 80-20. The 80, I'm, I'm sorry, we should focus on the 80. There's about 20% of a person, our spouse, let's say right now, that we don't like. Things that get on our nerves, things that bug us, things they do that we just don't like. And then there's 80% that we do like. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have married the person. So... Wait, wait, wait. Y'all got that, right? <laughs> Everybody that thinks it's about over, there's at least 80% of this that you bought into. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So um, what happens a lot of times when we get in that selfish mode, we tend to look at our spouse and think about the things that we don't get. And we start seeing the negative about that person. We start to focus on the negative, and that 20% feeds takes away from the 80 and it and the 20 percent tends to grow and then we focus on the negative and not the positive and we don't we start to lose um what really the good in the person yeah if you focus on the 20 percent of what's wrong with somebody it will become the 80 percent of what you see and it would become when it becomes the 80 percent of what you see it stops you from trying to maintain the commitment that it's going to require to get back to seeing the 80%, 80% of the time. But if you'll focus on the 80%, 95% of the time, you'll stop seeing the 20%. Y'all all right? See how this works? See how this works? You got, you, you, you've got to stop majoring on the minors. Look, the only time I ever remember her being selfish is it's, it's always got to do with French fries. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about this this week. It, it was one of our first dates, I guess. I was, I was a high roller and took her to McDonald's. <laughs> and, um, and I reached over because that's what we did in our family. And I got one of her fries and I got this look back like I can kill you. You know, and I thought, oh, my word. So, at any rate, she stopped doing that after she realized my reaction. But. Yeah, fries are my weakness. <laughs> I will say, if you go looking for the negative, you'll find it. Yeah. But if you go looking for the positive, you'll find it. So, what are you going to focus on? And by the way, this is it one side over the other. So, I don't need any spouses sitting here saying, well, as long as he'll start looking at my, the 80% of me, I believe mine's about 95 Stop it, because that's the second point I need you to understand. This is not only difficult, but commitment must be mutual. 
It must be mutual. You've both got to be committed. If one person is committed and the other is not, then we can't make it happen. You can't make it work because we can only deal with the people that are committed. It's got to be mutual. So our mutual relationship, well, let's see what the pastors have to say about this. Take a look at this. We, it started early on for us in our marriage. Um, so we had a really awesome wedding with 400 people and at the Renaissance Harbor downtown Baltimore, it was, it was awesome. And I came from a legalistic background and Tiff didn't. And I was like, no way we're gonna have pastors there and all these people, there's no way we're gonna have alcohol there. And it was the bigger thing was dancing. You didn't yeah, want dancing I, I didn't want any dancing. I, I didn't like, want any of that crap, any, right? any dancing, then we might as well just have barbecue. Yeah. Um, there's no need to have a fancy, well-paid for reception in a big yep. place with, you know, no, no dancing. No first dance for the couple, no dance <laughs> with my father. I mean, I just couldn't yeah, I was, imagine that of my wedding not including those things. Yeah. And so... Um, we did have dancing and all that there. But by the way, I, I did, I was, I was able to see what my wife, at the time my fiance, soon be wife, wife was telling me. And I look back at that now and go, how stupid was that? Like dancing? But you gotta understand the background I came out of. Very legalistic, um, like a Pentecostal type background. Um, and so now today, there's a lot of gray with me. A lot, not as much as my wife may have, but I'm getting better, and that was that was probably our, our big gray moment before we even got married. So, and I can dance if you want to see that. You don't want to see that. You don't want to see that. We made a deal early in our marriage. She would, when she was working and I was working, that if she cooked it, I would clean it. And she's a wonderful cook. She never argues about it. She's always been there and ready to cook. I can think there's nothing in the house to have and she can uh, have a meal on the table. So uh, she's cooked it and I've cleaned it. And I don't argue about cleaning and she didn't argue about cooking. And I can cook it, but I can get every pan we own dirty at the same meal. <laughs> and I can wash them. <laughs> when, when we got together, um, we had a lot of individual issues and, and mm -hmm. baggage. And um, we were new uh, Christians. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wasn't a Christian <laughs> when we first got together. Um, and wasn't sure about committing and all of that. Um, and that just prevented us from really taking our relationship seriously. Um, and then we found out we were pregnant before we got married. Oh, yeah. And um, that was tough. Um, and it shattered my, the image that I wanted to portray to everybody yeah. um, of this good guy um, that followed all the rules, uh, but secretly lived a different life. Um, and I mean, it was, it devastated me to the point where I locked myself in my room, my bedroom for like a weekend to just contemplate everything. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's anything like having a child that will force you to reevaluate your life and responsibility. And actually it matured me. Um, to the point where I said, do I want to, let's just be completely honest, do I want to myself become a statistic and make my wife or make uh, my girlfriend at the time and my future child a statistic? Mm -hmm. um, yet another child born out of wedlock with out a father in the picture and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it made me come to my senses and, and reevaluate things and go, no, I actually do love this woman and want to commit to living with, with her so that we can raise this child together. Mm -hmm. And um, through that, God just kept 
<laughs> peeling back layers and layers of selfishness uh, and insecurity and all sorts of internal issues within myself. He showed me those things um, and helped actually use Toya as a mirror for me to see myself. So I'm um, a child, the youngest of 13, raised by my father. Um, and so I was raised to do everything on my own and not to need anyone to, to do anything. And so just getting to that point of saying, um, I need you or I want you there or I have to consider your feelings and things of that nature was a total different uh, mindset for me. So it was, a, it was a work in progress. I think it was just, uh, it became a time of like secure, like you just felt, it felt secure. And I think as I got to a point when I became more spiritually mature and reading um, the Bible, I know we joke a lot about saying like what's biblically right, but at that point, I think that's what really connected with me and had been to live in order. And if we truly wanted to, um, to grow spiritually and to have that example um, for our family and to and generations to, to come, then I needed to be able to submit to my husband, so. Hmm? I think maybe our finances. Mm -hmm. We have made a decision um, pretty strongly and agreed about our finances. Yeah, well, I mean, I think recently we just bought a house, so there's so much stuff that there were certain things she wanted to do with the house that was important to her. There are certain things I wanted to do to the house that was important for me, uh, but we had talked about our finances beforehand, so we knew what our goals were. So it made us both kind of just step back from the things that we wanted in the moment and just kind of focus on our finances and which ended up being a smart thing because we had our roof and HVAC go out already. Mutual voluntary submission will constantly be challenged inside of your relationship. You need to know that. The enemy of our souls knows full well that if he can destroy the most important human relationship in our lives, he will find it easier to destroy our faith in the most important eternal relationship in our lives. And so he is constantly digging at our marriages. And our marriages will be challenged from all kinds of directions. You heard all, all the stories here. And can I just pause for a minute and just say a huge thank you to all of the pastors who were, all four of these couples, that were willing to be transparent and say to you what God's doing in their lives. They have done, the, the, what the stories they've told have made a huge difference because their story's not our story and our story's not your story. But what is true is that mutual voluntary submission to one another is constantly challenged. And in the spirit of transparency, you need to know that if you are not mutually committed to each other, you won't find security in your relationship. Early in our marriage, um, I was in ministry already, but early in our marriage and early in our ministry, um, we, we, I, I faced a moment where, um, where I had to refuse to hire someone who wanted to work at the church and was fully qualified for working at the church because I had an opening at, uh, not this church, but this is a long time ago. Uh, I had an opening and they were fully qualified for it and I could not hire her. Before I gave that information to her, I sat down with Tina and I explained, I can't hire her because she's our age and that's the only woman in this church that I find attractive. So, honey, I'm going to refuse to hire her. That actually made her feel secure. 
She didn't look at me and say, how dare you find somebody else attractive? Because at that point, I would have had to go, well, I'm breathing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> amen. And, um, and, and, but she understood it. In fact, she, <laughs> I probably should not have made her feel quite so secure because she went and told the lady. And, um, <laughs> that was awkward. So at any rate, so, but, but because I was honest, there came a security. And uh, in light of that, uh, a couple years later, I had a somewhat a similar situation in the sense uh, I was always, I was already working with someone. And it wasn't that I necessarily found this person attractive, but this person was giving me attention. Um, and there was a lot of joking and talking and, you know, cutting up and that kind of thing. And I found myself getting ready in the morning, thinking about what I'm going to look like to him, not to my husband. And I started feeling guilty, and I just started praying, God, you got to take these feelings away from me. And I remember, um, I, because our relationship was strong enough and I was secure in our marriage, and we talk a lot, I felt comfortable enough to talk to him about my feelings and what I was going through. And we sat in a Taco Bell and had this conversation. I've always been a big spender. <laughs> <laughs> and I was able to tell him how I was feeling. And I remember there were a couple of times that I went to the altar. And nobody knew what I was dealing with. But going to the altar and just praying to God, help me get rid of these feelings because I am committed to my husband. And I don't like the way this is. And eventually, and I'll, I'll be honest, I had to make, for this, for me to happen, I had to start looking at the negative for this guy and the positive for my husband and start seeing, um, just saying, you know, this person, this person, you know, and just trying to get rid of those feelings. And God turned my heart. And so I praise God because I reached out to him. He changed me. And we were able to save our marriage. You see this, right? Because sometimes I think what you think is that once somebody's called to ministry and they become a pastor and they get reverend in front of their name and she gets to be called first lady, that all the temptations go away. Y'all, that's not true. It's not a matter of lack of temptation. It's a matter of commitment to marriage. It's a matter of commitment to each other. We will be together and we will make this work no matter what we have to do to make this work. And the truth is, nobody, I'm not going to let any other woman get in the way of this relationship. Nor are we going to let any other man get in the way of this. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I better, I better, I better keep going. But now, now, I need you to understand something. There, there, this is... Stay with me on this. Now, listen, listen. Commitment is difficult. Commitment must be mutual. Now, I'm going to say something that's not going to make sense to you, and then I'm going to have to explain it. But in the end, commitment is simple. It's simple. It's, 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 it's not complex. It's not complicated. I say yes to her. And thereby, thereby, I say no to every other woman on the planet. I don't see what's complicated about that. That's simple. Let's see what the pastors have to say about a simple commitment. Unless you have the perfect marriage, and nobody does, um, when something knocks at your door or sits there or there's a situation or there are challenges, um, simple, the word simple takes a completely different meaning. And so for me, it's simple. Yes, my commitment is simple, but it's also hard at the same time because when I'm committed, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to hurt my wife. I don't want to do things that make her 
uh, sad, right? And I, I do, I have done that before, and I've made her sad. I have, I've said things to her that I, I, I regret. Um, but the commitment is that I'm, that we're going to be together. We're, I'm going to get better. She'll get better. And, uh, and so simple is not always simple as you would think. I think in, in marriage that the, the commitment, knowing that you haven't given yourself an option for an out. Correct. So that you have, you're going to work. So it means that you're determined to put in the work and, you know, even if it means having to sometimes sit and pray, you know, and say, Lord, he's yours before he's mine. And um, I'm going to just love him the way you have me love him. And if something needs to be worked out, you're going to work it out. Because, you know, at the time you feel like you're just, you know, you don't know where, you feel like you're just so frustrated or, or upset or sad or what have you. But, um, you know, knowing that you decided that it's, it's, it's forever. So... You know, what are you going to do in the meantime to get yourself to forever? Mm -hmm. Well, commitment is doing the thing you said you would do long after the feeling in which you set it in has left you. So commitment's just no matter what, like we have each other's back. And I think understanding that there's going to be really hard times where she's going to see the worst side of me. There's going to be times where I see the worst side of her. And it's just in those moments, it's just, it's commitment, it's simple. Like, I'm not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere. And that that brings this stability and this trust because if I know that she's not going anywhere and she knows that I'm not going anywhere, I feel like that makes us even work harder. It's not something you end up taking for granted. It's something that we actually work harder to please each other for because you're so... I don't know, it's an exciting thing to know that somebody's always got your back no matter what. How about that Curtis driving one home on the last point? <laughs> Commitment is doing the thing you said you would do long after the feeling you said it in has left you. That's what commitment is. That, that's what I mean when I say love is not a feeling. It's a choice of the will. The feelings come and go, but the commitment stays. And it's simple, though it's not easy. Let me, let me, let me explain. Let me explain. Basketball. You've all watched basketball? Has everybody picked up a basketball and tried to throw it through the hoop? Okay, basketball as a game, the concept is very simple. Put this ball through that hoop. It's not easy, but it is simple. Golf. Put this ball in that little hole over there. It's simple, but it's not easy. You know, football. Carry this ball, cross that line down there. Simple, but not e marriage. Love somebody. Wait, 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 wait. Choose one. Cherish one, belong to one. Simple, but not easy. Because the enemy of our souls is always fighting against us. It, it, the, the concept, y'all, it's like this. If you want to live a long life, just keep breathing. If you want to have a lasting marriage, just stay home. I remember, and we were, we, were, we were pastors. We were living in a parsonage. The church owned the house, which is a horrible idea, by the way. But we were living in the house owned by the church, and we had an argument. And I remember leaving the house. I was mad. Now, I knew full well I wasn't going anywhere. When I walked out that door, I knew I was going to walk back in. But I needed to make some kind of dramatic Hollywood point. <laughs> so I stormed out. I got in the car and I started driving. And I went, where am I going? <laughs> you know, not only is this a marriage thing in our case, but if I drive away, I lose my job. I lose my house. I lose my wife. I mean... You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, no, no, I knew I was coming back. 
It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's not complicated because, listen, in the end, this commitment that is difficult, mutual, and simple is chosen. And you have to choose. Every day. Every day. No matter what. You have to wake up every morning and choose. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. But Tina posted a picture of us when we were 18 this week. And um, I had hair. (laughs) And a mustache. And a mustache. (laughs) I weighed 145 pounds soaking wet. And I weighed probably about 100. (laughs) I mean, she, she, she had her a catch. 32 years ago. You did. Something happened. So the same choice she had to make 31 years ago when we woke up for the first day as husband and wife, she has to make again tomorrow. Stay with me. The same choice you made however many years ago, you got to make it again today and tomorrow and the day after that. You say, well, that sounds like drudgery. No, it's not. That, that, that is where the beauty lives. Because over time, trust takes hold. And where there's trust, there's security. And where there's security, there's peace. And in the rich, deep soil of trusting peace. Love grows really strong and really tall. That's what marriage is. I know, I know, I know you want us to tell you all of these beautiful stories. And yeah, I can tell you stories, romantic stories about sunsets and being on a boat and being at the beach. Yeah, I can tell you those stories. But those stories aren't where the rubber meets the road. The stories I can tell you that really made a difference was the day that I showed up to be there when she found out her mom died. The stories that matter, I'm sorry, are the days that she was sitting there waiting for me because she knew it had been a tough board meeting. Or she knew I had just been told off. See, on those days is when peace and trust and love takes root. But those days only come after you make the choice to choose this one over every other one in the world. Even your kids. Even over your kids. That's one of the things that our boys um, understood was that um, our marriage comes first. You come, that, that's true. you come second. That's true. And, and I, his thing was, if you make her, if you make her mad. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let me say it the way I said it to the boys. If you take off my girlfriend, <laughs> you will have ruined my day. And I will in turn ruin yours. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know some of you are re- rebelling at what Tina just said, but she's absolutely right. We would run off for a night or we would run off for a weekend sometimes. And um, as long as our our parents were willing to uh, take care of the kids and we would leave. And we would go cool places. And the kids would say, why don't you ever take us cool places? And I would say, well, you know what? When you get married, you can take your wife. But right now I'm taking her. And I ain't taking you. Because I want to be with her. And I'm going to be with you when I get back. I mean, you see what I'm saying? They're going to grow up and leave. And then what happens? Yeah. If you don't learn to know each other during that time, then when they leave, you're like, what next? And then you're like, who are you? You got, <laughs> sorry. But, I mean, you got, to, you got to take the time to show them that my, your commitment to each other is important, even over you, now, to the kids. All the dads in the room, all the husbands in the room, 
If you have sons, your sons are going to learn to treat their future spouse the way you treat their mother. And it's time that we raise a generation of boys that know how to be gentlemen. Now, hold on. I get a lot of amens on that one. (laughs) But ladies, your sons are going to marry someone like you. So if you don't like you, you're not going to like your daughter-in-law. So that means we've got to deal with ourselves to deal with our children. We can't deal with our children to deal with our children. We've got to deal with ourselves to deal. Y'all all right? We are getting way off. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Some good teaching. That's good. I, you want to amen? We'll amen our own self. <laughs> Here's what I need you to know. If you've been married for 70 years, you're going to have to wake up tomorrow and choose to stay. If you've been married for seven days, you're going to have to wake up tomorrow and choose to stay. Because in the end, a lasting marriage is all about a lasting commitment. And everybody listen to this. I want you to hear me. I said this the first week, but I need to say it again. No matter what your past looks like, Put it behind you. Get it at the foot of the cross. Get it under the blood of Jesus. And we're going to start today. We're going to start over. And by doing that, you're going to be able to start fresh and say, I still choose you. Here's what I want to do. In just a minute, we're going to pray. And... um. If your spouse is here with you and anywhere near you, I'm not going to ask you to do something awkward or strange or weird. Just hold hands, would you? Act like you like each other. And Tina's going to pray for all the wives in the room. Then I'm going to pray for all the husbands in the room. And then I'm going to pray for all of those who maybe your spouse is not here yet. I'm going to pray God will make you ready for when that spouse comes. And I'm going to pray for all of you who are struggling and you're not sure whether you're ready to make that commitment or not. Will you pray with us? Let's pray for our marriages. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word and what you have taught us. God, I pray for the wives that you would just give them a love for their husband that um, is a love like you have for their husband. Lord, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure that I'm speaking for a lot of other wives. We can use our tongue to tear down our husbands, to nag, to um, show disrespect. So, Lord, I just pray that you would begin showing us ways that we could edify and respect our husbands. Help us to love them um, the way they need to be loved. Lord, I just pray that you would just uh, help us to continue to choose day after day after day for that, for our spouse I think a lot of times we as moms tend to be the ones that would put our kids above our husbands. So, Lord, help us to be better at that. Help us to remember that it's our spouse um, that we need to put as the number one relationship. And then always being a mom, always loving our kids. But, Lord, help us to show how much we need to protect our marriage and love our husbands. Lord, I pray for anybody in here who is really struggling, Lord, that you would just come down and meet their need. Lord, I pray that you would convict us, open our eyes to the changes we need to make in ourselves, and that you would help us to make those changes. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for what you are going to do as we work toward making our marriage work. Father, 
as is normal when my girlfriend prays. There's very little left for me to say. But God, fill this room, this church, and this community with men. Men who know how to stand for their wives, by their wives, and live their lives in such a way that they make their wives' lives better. Teach us to be men that show our children, our sons and daughters, what real men are like. Teach us to be men that give to our wives the the cherishing that they need and the security that they need. Teach us to be men just like you showed us how to be a man when you came and you became our Savior. You tell us in Scripture that we should love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Lord, make that true. Now, Father God, for anybody in the room that's about to get married and make this commitment, fill them with the commitment and the determination to see this go forward. For anybody in the room whose marriage is struggling and they're not exactly sure whether tomorrow they're going to choose this person that is beside them, I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd bring healing, you'd bring progress, you'd bring an answer. And Lord, for someone that is waiting for the one they can choose, I pray that you'd make them ready, ready to be the one that can be chosen. Now, Father God, no matter where our marriages have been, no matter where we are right now, make new things out of us. Make new things out of our families. Make new things out of our marriages. And we will give you praise your name we pray. Thank you again for joining us. We hope that this resource helped you in your journey towards knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making an impact. Just so you know a little more about us, we're New Life, a church making a significant impact in every community we serve. We meet every weekend in multiple locations around the Washington, D.C. Metroplex and online several times throughout the week. If you want to connect, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for newlife.live and all of our content will be right there. If you enjoyed this resource, please subscribe, share it with your friends, or even take a screenshot and share it on your social stories and tag us. Lastly, we just wanted to give a special thanks to those of you who give generously to this ministry. It's because of you that this ministry is possible. If you'd like to learn more about how to partner with us financially, just visit newlife.live slash give for more information. That's newlife.live slash give for more information. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Thanks for being a member of our online family. We love making an impact with